Okay, so first tool or first point is to take a very clear or get clear, take a very close look and get clear on how you do relationships now versus how you used to do them in the past. This can be any relationship, friendships, business partnerships, uh, marriages, or whatever the relationships are, right, in your past. You know, and I've done this. I've taken a look at my past concerning relationships. But I only use my past as a reference guide. In my present life, right now, when I even think about my past, it's only pertaining to me as a reference guide. That's it. I only use my past as a reference guide. Very effective. Okay, and my support base, which makes part of my support base, <clears throat> base is very strong, pardon me, is because I use my past as a reference guide only. That took some self-discipline on my part, by the way. Yeah, I, I just slipped up so much in the beginning and, you know, my ego got in the way. So, <laughs> yeah, I had a lot of stuck points. But anyway, uh, tool number one is look at how you do relationships now versus how you did them in the past. Okay, because this will help you to determine if you're open right now to investing in healthy relationships versus toxic relationships.
okay and I know that helped me out a lot because as soon as I started looking at I you know I did the comparison I'm like okay you know I've, I've come a long way which leads me to my second point celebrate how far you've come yeah celebrate how far you've come absolutely because this way when you look at your past and you look at how you used to do relationships and you look at where you are now you have something to celebrate because you've made progress more than likely you made progress okay third and final point again you're gonna have some people that try to manipulate you right now because some people are not gonna like this new you they're not gonna like it <laughs> okay so some people right now they will try to emotionally manipulate you so that way you will start you know doing the toxic relationships again or give them another chance and especially if it's a narcissist they're trying to get back into your good graces and you know how terrible that can go all right that that's just a disaster waiting to happen okay so yes third and final point absolutely you want to stay you really want to stay mindful of where you are okay so third and final tool is this let people know especially those that you have a relationship with let them because you're going to be you're clear now you're focused you're clear right and you're celebrating how far you've come so third and final step you're going to finish that off with letting people know how you feel where you are like in other words you're going to effectively communicate you're going to put that into practice easier said than done yeah it is easier said than done because a lot of people really don't like to do a whole lot of communicating anyway about problems issues challenges and relationships every relationship has it but who wants to talk about it <laughs> right nobody a lot of people feel very uncomfortable with that however those of us who have healthy relationships we know is vital it's very important it's vital very important to be able to effectively communicate how you feel and what you think what's on your mind you know you have to express that and sometimes when conflicts come up I get how there that can cause triggers yeah I've been there done that yes that's very difficult and I actually did a video where I touched on that conflict resolution I think I did two parts with that one if you would please go ahead and check that out on your own time okay I think you will find those very useful the information in that very useful okay conflict resolution uh, I did a video on that but yes when we're you know having those conflicts and we don't feel so good you know it's like oh my goodness then you're triggered it could be quite a challenge it could add on to the challenge because all relationships have conflicts yeah even the best relationships have conflicts so when we incorporate conflict resolution along with effective communication hey we rocking then yes more than likely nobody's going to be like the narcissist threatening to slash your tires or performing some kind of other vandalism and cussing you out calling you everything but a child of god you know we don't have to worry about that with people that we're having healthy relationships with so third and final tool again is yeah just express how you feel put that into practice effective communication put that into practice easier said than done absolutely but this is going to be very effective and this more than likely you're not going to have a whole lot of people trying to emotionally manipulate you how come because you're showing that you care about yourself you're a little bit more vocal you're expressing yourself a little bit better right people are going to take a, a look at that like whoa okay this person yeah they expect to be treated well that's going to be the overall message because how you treat yourself is how other people are going to treat you okay so when you are gaining clarity this is going to help you to focus they kind of go hand in hand so you know your purpose is not to change others but to realize that you are changing in order to fulfill the legacy of your life okay some of you may have goals you may not have time to entertain the narcissist right especially when they're trying to knock you off your square but um, when you start to clarify certain things 
one of the first things you're going to notice is that you are outgrowing the narcissistic codependent relationship. So, you know, uh, narcissists, they tend to not like change at all. Okay, so when you're, gaining, when you're gaining clarity and you're gaining focus, he or she may, it's just it's very interesting how they may become disheveled. They may start to act like they're knocked off their square because they're not going to be expecting that curveball. Okay, so as you gain clarity, expect them to start, uh, well, some narcissists anyway, start to uh, behave as if they don't know what's going on. They don't understand this new you. They don't accept this new you, perhaps. Okay. All right. So uh, when you take accountability, this does not mean that the narcissist, again, you know, that they're being goody-goody or they're not doing anything to cause you some issues. No, it doesn't mean that at all. It just means that you're taking accountability, you're in control, you're practicing emotional discipline. Whereas the narcissist, of course they don't want you to practice emotional discipline because that keeps them starving. That keeps them from being able to uh, penetrate or to tap into your energy field, okay? Which, you know, again, they're looking for the supply. So when you start to take accountability for you, okay, yourself, well, then they're not going to have anything to point the finger at, okay? So, they're, I mean, it's not like they, they won't try. It's just that they won't have anything to put on you, okay? They're not going to really be able to blame you for anything and, you know, without looking like an idiot, right? So when you take accountability for yourself, for what you feel, what you think, the choices you make, for the things you have going on in life, see, that leaves the narcissist again starving. It's not that they won't try to project onto you. It's not even that they won't. It's just that they're going to risk looking like a complete idiot if they do. You're taking care of your own, okay? You're taking care of yourself. Perhaps you have children with a narcissist. Perhaps you're the one that has custody, right? You're taking care of, you're handling your business. So the narcissist is risking looking like a complete idiot when they point the finger at you and try to make you out to be the bad girl or the bad guy. So when you manage your expectations, this is what this looks like. You already know from your experience with the narcissist that he or she tends to pull shenanigans. Okay, so when you go ahead and just take accountability for yourself and take responsibility for however you're, you're coming into the relationship, right, instead of just looking at the narcissist, well, this is something, again, the narcissist is not going to be expecting because they want you in the argument. So especially when they goat you into an argument, they don't want to feel like they are a complete idiot and they're just out there swinging in the wind, right? <laughs> no, they want you involved. They want you engaged. So when you choose to take accountability for yourself, that's just another way of practicing emotional discipline. Okay, so, you know, the narcissists, they, they tend to not do that. They tend to point fingers. They tend to want everyone else to pretty much uh, take the blame for what they do, what they think, what they feel. So when you practice mindfulness and self-regulatory processes, that's another way, again, of managing expectations. It's just a re reflection of it. It's another way of practicing emotional discipline because when you practice mindfulness, Okay, there's four aspects of the mindfulness. That is practicing personal boundaries, which narcissists doesn't like to do, right? They don't like to respect anyone's personal boundaries. But also, when you are practicing mindfulness, you're also um, getting better at becoming assertive. Okay, instead of, you know, the narcissists, they like to bully, especially emotionally bully others, right? But when you're practicing assertion, that doesn't mean that you're on the defense. That just means that you are, well, it goes right back to handling your own, taking accountability, what you think, what you feel, where you are in the relationship, where you are in life, who you are, okay? So the narcissist is not going to be expecting that. Another aspect of practicing mindfulness is when you are, now see, this one gets a bad rap, what I'm about to say, but self-preservation. 
And I interpret that as just a person who is giving his or herself, give him or herself permission to what? Take care of themselves, okay? Become responsible for their own, to take better care of the self. And it kind of goes right into the self-regulatory processes should you become triggered by something he or she says. So when you practice uh, the personal boundary, it kind of goes hand in hand with practicing the um, self-preservation because you are handling yours. You're taking care of yourself, your own mind. You're in control, not the narcissist. And of course, you know, a lot of people who have been experienced in having relationships with narcissists or cluster personality types, they already know that narcissists, they like to be in control. So those that they target, if they're showing signs of being in control, then that is a direct threat to the narcissist's false self-images, which they have several of. And each false self-image, okay, has a mask, okay, assigned to it. But uh, when a person is practicing self-preservation, it's just another way of saying that they are in control of themselves. They choose to be uh, in control. They choose to not become reactionary when a narcissist says and or does something. And so the fourth aspect of mindfulness is, I think I mentioned, let me just go back down the line, personal boundaries, self-preservation, assertion, and I'm forgetting the fourth one. I'll just keep talking. It'll come to me. <laughs> but anyway, self-regulatory processing, right? Should you become triggered? This is just another way of soothing yourself. Okay, so the narcissist, of course, they want you to be knocked off of your square instead of being in control. So when you're practicing mindfulness, okay, that it goes hand in hand with self-regulatory processes. Narcissists and some cluster personality types, they tend to groom those that they target for source supply. So this means that the ones that they target for source supply, they, the narcissist expects him or her to behave, think, and feel a particular way that's going to get them the source supply. Okay, so uh, when a person practices mindfulness, you know, they're going to they're gonna be the person who's more, you know, in control. They're going to be demonstrating their growth, right? So uh, just expect the narcissist to not really like this so much. But when you begin to manage your expectations, that's what that looks like. You are taking off the rose-colored glasses. You're seeing things for what they really are. You're not sugarcoating anything. And the narcissist, they won't be able to come back with some kind of story to sell you, right? Such as telling you who you are versus you knowing who you are. They like to also create a false image of those that they target for source supply. Okay, so when you take off the rose-colored glasses, that, this also reflects that you're managing your expectations of not only yourself, but the narcissist. And this does not work for the narcissist because they like to keep people off their square. If you are focused, right, and you are gaining clarity, see, a lot of people who deal with narcissists, they are highly intuitive Okay, not saying that narcissists are not highly intuitive because some of them are. But a lot of people who have been targeted by narcissists in their own life, they tend to be highly intuitive individuals. So when you're gaining clarity, how does that look? Well, or some examples of that is that you may keep a dream journal. You may be having dreams about the narcissist. Okay, you may be, and sometimes this is unexpected. So this is another way of, of gaining clarity. <clears throat> Pardon me. You're gaining clarity when you're jotting down or you're writing or you're keeping a dream journal because you may read something and you're like, oh my God, right? You're having a revelation. You may 
realize something that's going on in that relationship that perhaps you weren't ready to see for a long time. But when you dreamt about it, something was revealed to you. Okay, so this is another way that you may be gaining clarity. But when you manage expectations, this is to clarify, to give you a clearer perspective on what's going on in that relationship with the narcissist and the cluster personality type. And this goes right on to how you're able to focus. Because when you start putting all these things together, you can focus on what really needs to happen in order for you to do what? Yeah, thrive forward. Grow past the relationship. Most of you already know you're outgrowing it. You're outgrowing those relationships. They're very toxic. They're very, because of the subtle signs of codependency. Okay, so uh, the mindfulness, okay, uh, the four aspects, personal boundaries, self-preservation, and what was the other one? Assertiveness, self-preservation, and I can't, I, I don't know why, guys, I cannot remember <laughs> the four aspects of mindfulness. You guys forgive me. But anyway, I can't remember it right now, but maybe it will come back to me later. Okay, let's keep moving shall we okay all right but besides a lot of you who've been watching my videos you already know okay you already know the f the four aspects of mindfulness all right so excuse my brain fart okay <laughs> all right all right so uh, once the person takes off the rose colored glasses yeah they're going to be ready they're going to probably have more confidence to move on anyway and of course, the narcissist, they, doesn't, they don't like this type of change, okay? So there's the denial, the acceptance, and the misuse of ego. These are signs that it's time to let go. It's time to let go of the narcissist. It's time to let go of that narcissistic codependent relationship. Or it may be time to at least contemplate uh, shifting the gears and strategizing your next step. Some people have done this already. Congratulations, you know. And every situation is different. Everyone is not able to just, you know, move on with easy transition, right? But where they are today, see, it starts in the mind, not the behind. A person can, for instance, <laughs> they can pack their bags and be gone, right? But mentally, psychologically, perhaps even emotionally, they're still with the narcissist or they're still in that, they're very much involved in the narcissistic codependent relationship, right? And that kind of ties into that denial or cognitive dissonance that some people have experienced, right? So this is one of the first signs, right? That a person should look for when it's time to detach from the narcissistic codependent relationship because they're going to be in denial for a minute because that's going to take some adjustment on his or her part in order to thrive forward. It starts in the mind. A person can make that move, right? The phys physically, they're out, they're gone. But energetically, spiritually, perhaps even emotionally, due to perhaps toxic ties, soul uh, ties, trauma bonds, okay? They haven't left that relationship. And, you know, I'm not saying all this so someone can feel badly or any of you can feel badly. No, no. I'm saying this because this is very common. This is, this is an experience I have even had. It's never easy when a when person first starts to... Uh, thrive forward. It is not easy, but it's well worth it. Okay. Because this is a change. Sometimes a person may find out that they are the catalyst to a much needed change, not only in their own life, but somebody else's life. So, you know, uh, one of the first signs to look for is denial. You know, you're gonna, it's like, you're going to be pushing back from reality, but when you deny 
that the quality of the relationship with the cluster B personality type is there, you know, it, it's, it, it is, it's the denial. It's kind of like you're pushing back from, it's like you're putting that, you're putting the rose colored glasses back on again and you're pushing back from what you know your intuition is telling you that that relationship is not going to go anywhere. The narcissist probably won't change. So when you deny the quality of the relationship with a cluster B personality type, such as a borderline personality, okay, that has come to a close or it's very poor. When you start to deny this, it's time perhaps to let go. All right. So, you know, you will not be able to love, to care, okay, to support, to console, negotiate, bargain, rescue, or explain well enough why those relationships are not within alignment with why you even exist. Simply put, that relationship that you're having with a narcissist, see, it's going to become very clear that it just doesn't compute. It doesn't, it just doesn't fit. You're no longer a vibrational match to the narcissist or close to personality type like you once were, right? Some of you are already experiencing this. But even if you haven't gotten there yet, you know, give it a little time. Don't, you know, your, your healing is not a contest. Don't put so much pressure on yourself. The narcissist does that. Don't do that to yourself. <clears throat> but you're never going to be able to explain well enough why those relationships are not within alignment with why you even exist, with who you are. What's the, you know, one of my favorite critical questions to ask, and I have asked this question in several of my videos, and that is, what is the purpose of the narcissistic codependent relationship? Why is it, I mean, why are you experiencing that? But, uh, but again, the deeper question is, what is the purpose of the narcissistic codependent relationship? Every life, like every relationship, has a purpose or serves a purpose. And I know some people may feel uncomfortable, um, you know, saying that or yet alone hearing that from someone as if to say that, if they're in a painful relationship, they deserved it. Not at all, not at all. But every relationship, like every life, serves a purpose. There's a story behind the story. We're all experiencing this thing called life, right? It's a gift nonetheless, but it comes with, with challenges. So acceptance, right? But you know what, before I get to that, before I get to the acceptance part, I just want to say, you know, your purpose is not to change others, certainly not the narcissist, but perhaps your purpose is to realize that you are changing in order to fulfill the legacy of your life. And the narcissist, or the narcissist, close to personality uh, type, relationship, you know, just dealing with narcissistic abuse may be a hindrance, okay? What, what is the purpose of your life, right? Certainly not to be narcissistic food. So, you know, try to find the grace and good in every goodbye. Sometimes in life, we just got to let certain people go. Just got to do it. And this is showing grace as well as mercy. And I know uh, some people may not feel comfortable with that. Whichever side of the fence they may be on, they may not be comfortable with receiving grace or mercy. They may not be comfortable with providing, you know, grace and mercy, you know, or, or finding it. But, you know, life rewards those who find the love to let people go. Life tends to reward those people who are not afraid to say goodbye. Okay, especially when it's not serving a purpose in their life. So those people, you know, letting go of the people, places, and things that are not within alignment of your life, it, it, it may be time to contemplate that or to look at that, you know? And of course, love yourself through it all. It's not, you know, it's, it, it, this is one of the things that I found out. 
It's not about demonizing other people, guys. You know, it, it's not about even demonizing yourself. Narcissistic codependent relationships are designed to be highly addictive for everyone involved, whether it's the narcissist, cluster personality type, or those that are targeted for source supply. You know, it's just, it's, it's not easy. But at the end of the day, it is not about demonizing self or others. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not sitting up here saying <laughs> that some people's behavior is not demonic. I mean, some of it is demonic. Okay? Not everybody's behavior, though, is demonic. It might be painful, but it's not demonic. It may be abusive. Now, that can be, okay, you can easily transfer that to being demonic, right? But at the end of the day, it is not about demonizing anybody, and especially yourself. You got to love yourself, guys, okay? So that's one of the, the biggest revelations I've had thus far in my life. It is not about demonizing anybody else, regardless of their behavior, because at the end of the day, Everything that that narcissist does, it goes right back to sender. And I don't mean to make it sound like I'm judging. We're all comprised of energy, though. What we put out comes right back. Okay? So, um, all right, acceptance. By accepting that you are outgrowing relationships, you know, that are very painful without any real purpose behind it, is a sign that it's time to detach, okay? When and how to emotionally detach from narcissistic codependent relationships, okay? It sounds like a lot, sounds like a tall order, but it's well worth it. Gotta put one foot in front of the other. Gotta just take those steps, right? When you start to accept that you're outgrowing that relationship, what else are you going to do, right? But naturally, go ahead and thrive. You've already survived. What, where else are you going to go? What, what is the next thing? You graduate to become a thriver. See, you, you're a survivor already, but you graduate to becoming a thriver. So by accepting that you are outgrowing the relationship, Okay, this relationship is very painful. Probably the most painful relationship you've ever had. So many unanswered questions. The narcissist does not want to seem to meet you or anyone else for that matter halfway. They just want the source supply. Whenever a person is being let down and put down repeatedly by a narcissist, that's a lot of pain. A lot of pain. So the sting is when the narcissist does not or seems to intentionally leave things unsaid and undone in the relationship. They make promises, break the promises on purpose. And, and again, this is seem the way, it seem to be that way. But it may be time to, to detach emotionally, okay? When you start to accept that you're done with all that drama, See, the, the narcissists, they produce or they create all that drama only to catch karma. See, don't think that they're going to get away with it. Not that it's my call or your call. But the bottom line is, narcissists tend to not ponder or look at the cost of them attempting to obtain narcissist supply from anyone. They, they too, they're too busy salivating over the rewards or what they think they're going to get. So they don't, con they don't contemplate the long term. You know, uh, figuratively speaking, what is, the, what, is the, <laughs> what is that 30 pieces of silver going to cost you know, some narcissists tend to have that Judas effect or that Judas way about him or her. 
They want the 30 pieces of silver, but they don't consider the cost. What is it going to cost? What did the 30 pieces of silver get them, really? Even if memory serves me correctly, um, and you all can, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but once Judas received the 30 pieces of silver, he went out to hang himself. He was done for. He was, he was done for. So the 30 pieces of silver were scattered on the ground. And the way I interpret that, you know, people interpret that biblical reference differently. But, I, you know, again, it's just a biblical reference to the point I'm making. And that is when the 30 pieces of silver were scattered on the ground, to me that was the 30 pieces of silver scattered on, on the earth, on the planet. able to, making it able for those who didn't do any wrong to be able to partake of those 30 pieces of silver so good can happen in their life, right? The so-called, or, or Judas, right? The person who betrayed Jesus, hey, you know, the 30 pieces of silver were scattered about the earth for those who can really use it and put it to some good. The person who never intended to do any good with it didn't end up spending it at all, but it cost them. See, narcissists don't think about things like that. They just want the, they want the supply. They don't think about long-term. It's right, right here, right now. Give it to me now, right? <laughs> who cares who gets hurt? So when you start to accept <clears throat> that you're outgrowing it, yeah, it's, it's time to go ahead and learn how to emotionally detach. Some people may need to spiritually detach, mentally detach, psychologically. I mean, down the line, they may just need to detach from the narcissist and or the narcissistic codependent relationship, which is designed, again, to be highly addictive. And a lot of that is due to the narcissist grooming those that they target for source supply. So, you know, there are many reasons that the relationship are full of ups and downs, the back and forths, the tit for tat, the one upmanship. Okay? All of that is by grand design. Just to keep a person in the sunken place or in a state of despondency. And the narcissist loves that. You know, that that's, you know, if they love anything, it would be that. You know? So, you know, life is not without challenges, conflicts, issues, and disagreements with those that we love and care about, right? But when it comes to the narcissist, it's kind of like, where's the love, <laughs> right? Where, where is the love, right? It's like, okay, there's no love here, or it doesn't feel like it. So when you start to accept some things, yeah, it, it's time to go ahead and let go. But when a person, uh, it, this could be the narcissist too, who begins to misuse ego. See, we're not supposed to get rid of the ego. We all need our ego. It, it, it serves a purpose. But when a person starts to misuse the ego, that is another sign it is time to let go of that relationship. It is time to let go of the narcissist. And, you know, take off the rose-colored glasses and perhaps stop idealizing him or her. See, it goes both ways. Sometimes the narcissist will idealize others and this is reflective of them creating a false image of those that they, you know, seek for source supply. They may, the narcissists may tell themselves that you are A, B, and C, or you're this person or that person, right? You're this way or you're that way. And reality says otherwise. You say otherwise. But does the narcissist care? Mm -mm. <laughs> no, they want the source supply. So when they start to put you up on this pedestal, perhaps, and they idealize you, see, that's just the other side of that coin. Both of you could be idealizing each other. And this is not me attempting to scold anyone or to point fingers. No, I'm just simply saying how sometimes the narcissistic codependent relationship can have people caught up. And they may mirror each other. The narcissist may mirror him or her. The source may mirror the narcissist. See, it's very, very, you know, complex. But it can be very diabolical the way the narcissist 
carry out their behavior or their plans of obtaining narcissistic supply the whole time for the duration of the relationship. Ever wonder why it's so easy for them to move from one person to the next? Because they don't ever give of themselves in the relationship. They're too busy idealizing others and want others to idealize them or put them up on a pedestal. But see, the moment you fall from grace, that's when the narcissist really lets you know what was up, okay, the whole time. See, they never cared about the heart. They want to possess the mind of those that they target for source supply. But the misuse of ego, again, is another sign that it's time to let go because the narcissist, you know, they are some of the most egotistical individuals on the planet, aren't they, right? <laughs> yeah, but when you start to misuse your ego, see, it, it, it may be time to, yeah, to let go of that relationship because perhaps some of you have come to the conclusion that that relationship is not bringing out the best in you. The narcissist tends to bring out the worst in you, perhaps. Some of you may have already, you know, um, you know, you maybe have already come to this conclusion. But the misuse of ego is another big one. All right, let's go ahead and move on. All right. <clears throat> You know, and I don't think I mentioned anything about the crazy making, but um, I think I touched on it a little bit. But that crazy making is another is another sign that perhaps it is time to let go of the relationship. Okay, I didn't mean to pause it. Here we go. Let's see. Let's see if I can skip up a little bit. Let's go. Let's go. All right, just a little. Y'all bear with me. I was trying to get this slide together early today, but I didn't want to just slap anything together for y'all. <laughs> Can't do that. I want y'all to have good slides here okay trust violations yeah this is a big one okay so when dealing with a narcissist plus be personality type uh trust is going to be violated hands down can't avoid it okay the trust will be violated period so when a narcissist violates your trust, okay, I don't want to go to the tools yet. Okay. So when they violate your trust, this can leave a lot of scars, a lot of wounds. Okay. So you guys don't really need me to tell you that you know that anyway, the narcissist is the one that really doesn't give a rat's ass about who they leave behind with the pain. They don't, they don't really care about that as long as they get the supply. So when the trust is violated, they don't care about the damages, the long-term damages. So some people end up not trusting anyone after they have dealt with a narcissist. See, a lot of people have dealt with more than one narcissist in their life, right? So when the trust has been violated, that's a very deep wound that seems to go for a long time. But the trust, see, with the narcissist may not ever be repaired, but that's okay. A person can learn how to trust, period. Doesn't have to be the narcissist. The narcissist has already violated your trust. And some of them have the nerve to even try to get a second chance or maybe a third chance or maybe even a fifth chance to do what? That would be the main question. Uh, another chance to do what, right? What would, the, what would be the purpose of a narcissist trying to hoover a person back in? 
and you know, I've done a few videos about that, is to shield him or her from, well, one of the reasons is to shield him or her from experiencing the full extent of consequences from pulling shenanigans, from engaging in bio biological, biological, where did I get that word from? <laughs> from engaging in the diabolical tactics, right? Right. So when the trust has been violated, a person has to deal with that. They may have to go see a counselor. They may have to go see someone for quite some time where the narcissist is just moving right along to the next person. They don't care about the damages that they have left behind. Sometimes a person can't even, uh, or they are finding it difficult to start a new relationship. And this is not just romantic relationship. This is any type of relationship you can think of. It is hard for him or her to trust enough to start a new relationship that could be healthy. This is very common after dealing with a narcissist. Okay. And the narcissist don't even, most of the time they don't even, <laughs> they don't even trust themselves. All right. They don't even trust themselves. They don't trust Life, I don't think. I don't even think narcissists trust life. And what I mean by that is some of the good things that happen in life, they, they may question it. Like, why are you being nice to me, they may say. Or they, they may question that. Anytime a narcissist comes across someone who may be good to him or her, they may question it. They may go the extra mile to question it. They may just look at everyone with uh, suspicion. They may be paranoid. Okay? But when that trust has been violated, it goes real deep, very deep. So trust issues are, you know, one of the largest issues that people face as an aftermath of exposure to narcissistic codependent relationships. Okay, now this goes double if a person has been involved with a narcissist or several of them for a long period of time like if the narcissist is a family member, or maybe there were several family members that a person has, I mean, maybe since their childhood, which again, I would say is uh, exposure to adversity at a very early age, okay? But the bottom line is this, when narcissists uh, have done so many, you know, pull so much BS, right? That it leaves a person not having a lot of faith in relationships or positive relationships. They start to, perhaps they start to think or doubt that they can ever be involved in a positive relationship, that they can ever have real friends. And then they may even start to think that narcissists rule the world or they're all over the world or they rule their world. Okay, now, okay, yeah, we know that there are people all over the planet that may have close to personality types and such as a narcissist, right? But in your world, are they taking over? See, some people may think and feel that, which that's understandable, especially after the trust has been violated. So when a person is triggered by narcissists, by something they, you know, say and or do, they may become reactionary, but guess what else happens, guys? When somebody else says or does something that may not be a narcissist. See, a person who has been dealing with a narcissist for so long, they can become easily triggered by something that someone that is trustworthy may say and or do because they may be looked at with suspicion. I hope that makes sense because this is something that's also common with people who have dealt with narcissists. This doesn't mean that it's all doom and gloom. This just means that after dealing with a narcissist and having the trust violated, that means that everybody may become suspect. And again, this is just maybe. But you see how that can kind of bleed over into positive relationships or what could be a positive relationship? So even, uh, for instance, a person may go to a counselor. After dealing with a narcissist, they may go to a counselor or a clergy, okay? And they're, they may want to reveal certain things that they have gone through in that relationship. But it may be hard to divulge certain things or to uh, reveal certain things, 
Okay, you're just part of this you because you're giving intimate details of your experiences with narcissists. So it's not easy at all anyway, right? So the person, the clergy or the uh the person, the mentor or the person, the counselor that you're talking to or it could be a friend, right? They may have already proven or they have shown to be trustworthy, but for some reason you you know, you may not be able to trust him or her at all. And perhaps you have been uh, and this is an example, I'm not picking on you, okay, this is just in general. A person, I'll just say it like this, a person could be, have, you know, they can be dealing with a clergy or the mentor or a person for a long time who is trustworthy, but because they have had so many experiences with narcissists that ended up whereas they couldn't trust the narcissist, right? It bleeds over to all the other relationships with people who really are trustworthy. And this is unfortunate but it happens far too often. So that has to be repaired. So this is another reason why I say that the narcissist has no business in anybody's uh, support system. When you have a support base, the narcissist shouldn't be there at all. They, matter of fact, I say don't even tell them about it. They, they, they really, they have no place there. They've already violated your trust. And maybe a few other things too, you know, they have violated that. So the trust issue is one of the largest issues that people do face after they have dealt with a narcissist. So, you know, it's no question that the ability to trust must be restored after experiencing the betrayal of trust. Okay, after that betrayal has been experienced, guys, and I know some of you know about this. After that has been experienced, it is no wonder that people sometimes may have uh, or they may be it's hard for them to trust even when they are loved and cared for it's hard to trust that narcissists leave so much damage behind you know when they do things but the real stinger is that they really don't seem to care about that they're too busy reenacting their own unresolved issues and or pain see all narcissists don't come from uh, having a childhood, a bad childhood. You know, we all have some uh, challenges in childhood. But a narcissist, when they do what they do, it is not always because in their childhood they were abused. And I felt like I really needed to say that, right? It's not always the case. Sometimes they will try to convince some people that they have been abused as children when that is just not the case. So, you know, when you learn to trust again, or learning how to trust again, right? We'll take learning how to trust yourself first. So that is, you know, that's one of my tools. Trust yourself first. Learn how to trust yourself first. Don't try to, you know, trust somebody else because it's going to take time for you to build that up. It's going to take time. So, you know, channeling your own energy would be a game changer. The narcissist is already, you know, they have tried to tap into your energy over and over. And that also can result in trust being violated because they'll lie, okay, right? They will manipulate, smear a campaign, care to assassinate. All, all these things are, are is a violation of, of trust. So, you know, when you learn how to channel your own energy, that's a real game changer right there. The narcissist won't know what to do with that. So the narcissistic codependent relationship is designed to drain you of your energy. It is also highly addictive. So wasting time, money, resources, gifts, talents, and energy on those who you know to have narcissistic traits will knock you off balance. Every time, guys, it will knock you off balance, keeping you right where the narcissist wants you instead of where you want to be, right? So, you know, uh, learn how to trust yourself. Some people, and again, your, your recovery from narcissistic abuse is not a contest. It really isn't. This is one thing I had to learn, too. You know, it, it wasn't a contest, and it's still not. I'm still thriving forward. I'm still doing things that I need to do to focus on thriving forward. It's not about looking left, right, up, down, backwards, forward. No, it sometimes is is about looking within 
right? It's about doing that so you can continue to do what you need to do to thrive forward. And the people that you love and care about, they want the best for you too. Ever notice how the narcissists, they may say they want the best for you, but they really don't. The proof is in the pudding. Look at how they behave, right? So they don't always want the best for you. But I just wanted to go ahead and put that out there because I know some people right now, they're really struggling with dealing with narcissists that may still be in their life at this time. Okay, so I want to go ahead and get into the tools. I didn't want to be too long-winded tonight. I didn't want to uh, <laughs> do the live stream too long because I know sometimes uh, I can go for quite some time with the live streams. I know some of y'all know that. But, um, yeah, I wanted to really put this out here tonight. So, you know, control is what the cluster B personality type, such as narcissists, that's really what they feed off of. That's really what gets their goat going. That's really what they, gets them going. That gets their juices flowing, right? So, but you want to be in control. You're gonna, you know, this is, this is something that a lot of us have to still do. We have to take the steps of being in control rather than allowing the narcissist to be in control. It's interesting how they will claim the life of a person that they're targeting for source supply. And at the same time, they will groom the person to not even claim their own life because they're too busy trying to, what, please the narcissist. That's just another way of saying a person not claiming their own life when it comes to the narcissist. But the narcissist will claim his or her life in order to obtain source supply. Very interesting how that turns out. So... Okay, let's get into the tools. All right. Oh, my mouse is acting up. <clears throat> let's see. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Tools, tools, tools. Yeah. From my own personal experience, I can tell you that trust is is just that's the that's the most challenging part of healing and and recovering past narcissistic abuse just being able to learn to trust again starting with the self you know okay so tool number one discontinue claiming what does not belong to you tool number two take steps to frequently try something new tool number three Practice mindfulness and focus intention techniques. Now, this is my opportunity to go over the four aspects of mindfulness that I couldn't remember earlier. You know, I had that brain fart, right? <laughs> but the four aspects are personal boundaries, assertion, emotional discipline, and uh, self-preservation, okay? So when a person, let me jump back to uh, two number one. When a person discontinues to claim what does not belong to him or her, that goes right into them not claiming who they're not. The narcissist creates a false image of those that they target. So when a person is claiming to be someone they're not, this supplies the narcissist. So any signs of your growing past the narcissist is automatically going to be a threat to his or her false self images all of them they have several false self images right so when you discontinue claiming what does not belong to you that's another direct threat and or challenge to the narcissist's false self images when they are pulling shenanigans there's a lot of names that you can come up with <laughs> that they are you know they you say they, they okay they're pulling a lot of shenanigans and they that makes them an ass right so why would you claim to be an ass this is just an example the narcissist wants you to claim that see the thing when they pull stuff they want you to claim to be who they really are behaving like or who they really are you see how that works so when they pull bs and they're acting like an ass they want you to claim that they want you to walk around feeling upset 
like you were the ass in the situation, but they were. So discontinue claiming what does not belong to you. Discontinue uh, claiming what or who you're not, right? What doesn't belong to you? The shenanigans, you're not pulling them. The narcissist is, but yet they want you to take the hit for it. They want you to take the fall for it. Falling from grace, okay? They want you to be a shield or a buffer from them catching karma from what they have done, right? They want you to pay for the consequences instead of them uh, experiencing the full extent of the consequence. Tool number two, take steps to frequently try something new. This is, the body remembers, right? It records everything. Even when we try to forget maladaptive coping skills, right? Smoking, drinking, sex, food, whatever, right? Rock and roll, <laughs> rap, whatever, right? Anything we try to do to uh, forget the things that are painful. See, the body remembers, it records it. So take steps to frequently try something new. This is going to uh, get your body accustomed to something new. Therefore, you're creating new uh, energy and you're also creating new memories. You're releasing heavy energy that does not serve you. So take steps to frequently try something new. That way your body becomes accustomed to something new, something more pleasant. And that's also how the contrast happens, comparing apples to oranges. The rotten apple is the narcissistic codependent relationship that you have with the narcissist. The juicy orange are those relationships that you have that are very positive. They leave you feeling great, right? So when you're trying something new, you're also obtaining the contrast. What does the contrast do? Or what's the purpose of the contrast? To obtain peace of mind right? Harmony and balance in your life. And whether people uh, notice or not, or they uh, are conscious to it, they're looking for the balance in life. They're looking for some peace of mind, or they would like peace of mind. Okay, so, but the contrast provides these things. And balance, you know, balance, peace, and harmony. Some people are not, uh, you know, they're not uh, cognitive of, or they're not aware that they're looking for these things in every aspect of their life. Sometimes, it okay, you like to say, there's time to fight, there's a time to rage war, there's a time to be peaceful, all these things. But through it all, people still, you know, deep down, I think they value peace, harmony, and balance. But there's a time for it, right? Okay, so tool number three, practice mindfulness and focus intention techniques. Okay, so we went over the mindfulness part. The focus intention techniques are to focus on what you intend to manifest. Okay, so does a person intend to manifest the pain of narcissistic codependent relationships? Probably not. But guess what the narcissist does? See, they're the catalyst of getting people to focus on what hurts, the pain, what's not working. But it's very interesting how, especially when the narcissist wants to hoover you back in, they want you to forget. See, they want you to forget something. Any guesses what they want you to forget? See, they want you to forget how they obtained the narcissist's supply from you. And the thing that the narcissist doesn't forget is that they obtained it from you. They want to forget how they obtained it from you. See, they have selective amnesia. So they want you to focus on what hurts, what doesn't work, what's painful, until they want to hoover you back in. And then they want you to focus on their positive side, if there was any, right? Well, they'll try to make it up. They'll try to fluff it up and glamorize it for you, even though it really sucked the things that they used to do in the relationship, but when they're trying to hoover you back in, see, they'll try to glamorize it and fluff it up and make it seem better than it really was, right? <laughs> so, yeah, the focus intention technique will help you to focus on what you intend to manifest. Narcissists do have a selective amnesia. See, they want to, they never forget that they obtained the supply from you, right? 
They want to forget how they obtained it, but they will never forget that they, they have obtained it. That's why they recycle source supplies, okay? And who was their best supplier, okay? They have several pawns in the game, but make, make no mistake, the narcissists, they recycle. They recycle those that they supply or get the supply from, right? All right. It's very interesting how they have the selective amnesia. Okay, guys. <clears throat> All right. Let's see who's in the chat. All right. Okay. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Truth, why not? Welcome, welcome. See, see Shell, welcome to the live stream. All right. Let's see who else is here. Nathan, welcome, welcome. Ellie Wynn is with us tonight. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Susan Ralph, welcome to the live stream. All right. Let's see some of your comments. Let's see. Seashell says, help my cousin is a narcissist, same cycle with women, horrible discards, the latest re relocated from the U.S. and is starting to feel crazy. I feel so bad for her. I know how it feels in a confused state. Wow. Okay, Seashell, thank you so much for sharing that. And yeah, whenever, some, whenever we have loved ones, and I did a video about this, by the way, when sometimes when we have people, some people in our families, they may choose, see, they may choose to uh, continue to have a relationship with a narcissist or a cluspy personality type that's in our family, or maybe it's their lover or their spouse, right? And it's very hard to uh, see them going through what they're going through, but sometimes it's best to um, say if you advise them, if they ask you for advice and they're reaching out to you, and see, you can only do what you can do. And sometimes it's best to just say what you have to say that one time and then just leave it alone. And I, and I know it's hard. That's someone you love and care about. But sometimes, guys, you just have to get to the point where you know you have done all you can do. Everybody cannot be saved. Okay? And, and I'm speaking from the heart here. I know. I've been in a situation where a loved one was being hurt by somebody uh, that also hurt me, okay? So it's very hard. You, uh, you can only do what you can do. So I wish you the best, Seashell, but I'm telling you from experience, <laughs> you just sometimes you just gotta, that's, that's the best way to love someone that you really love is to, you know, they reach out to you, they say, and you say what you have to say, and, you know, you put a lot of love on it, but then you just gotta step back and just hope and, uh, you know, that they will take heed to what you have said and that they can feel your love, right? And uh, it is hard though. It's hard to see somebody going through it, especially if you've gone through it too, right? Okay, let's see. Nathan says, I, I only was able to pull it all together when I acknowledged that trust was the main issue. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nathan, for your comments. And uh, yeah, that trust, I, from personal experience, I'm going to tell y'all, that trust thing, yeah, very hard. That's the toughest. That to, for me, that was the toughest. Because once the trust is violated, I mean, you really, it's like, it's, it's like you really can't repair it. And it takes, I mean, it takes, if someone wants to, that's something else I want to say about that too. If somebody wants to, reconcile let's just say if the narcissist uh wants to reconcile right maybe they have turned over a new leaf yeah right slim chance <laughs> but anyway for example let's just say the narcissist really wants to reconcile right well the first step to that especially if the trust has been violated is to make atonement how can anyone reconcile without making atonement now, what does atonement mean? That means everyone involved is taking responsibility. Because remember I was talking about accountability? 
Yeah, everybody takes responsibility for their part in that relationship and the breakdown of the relationship. What was their part? What was your part? And in order for the reconciliation to take place, the, progress, the, the prerequisite, see I'm getting tongue-tied here, right? Is the atonement. That gotta happen first. Some, you know, a narcissist sometimes, they'll try to put the, the cart before the horse. And they'll sit up there and they'll try to hoover you back in and try to make things better than it really was, right? Trying to make it sound like it was all, you know, great. And sometimes they'll try to belittle the things that you went through that caused you grief. Because again, the selective amnesia, they don't want to remember how they got the supply from you. But they, you better believe they remember getting it. They don't want to remember how they got it. How did they get it? Perhaps they got it through pulling the shenanigan of smear campaigning you or telling everybody that you were, you know, the bullshitter or full of BS when it was them, when it was them all along. But my experience has taught me that in order for reconciliation to happen, the atonement must take place first. That means everybody involved must be ready, willing, and able to take responsibility for their part in the breakdown of the relationship. What had people growing in different directions? Not necessarily going in different directions because, you know, uh, sometimes the relationship has run its course and it's time to go ahead and see the good and the goodbye. Yeah. And just um, when the narcissist tries to hoover back in, or you know, that may be a great question to, to ask him or a great statement to make to them. Well, are you ready to make atonement? <laughs> And just see how fast they get out of there. Because atonement means that they have to take responsibility for everything that they have uh, brought into that relationship. The energy, the spirit, the, the mindset. What type of mindset did they have when they met you? Or if this is a family member, how did they treat you? What type of mindset did they have? All of that. That's what atonement means, you know, people taking full responsibility. But, um, you know, some narcissists, they're not willing to do that, right? Yep. So uh, let's see here. Look at some of your comments. I just saw one I wanted to get to. My mouse is acting up, y'all. <laughs> let's see. Let's see. Susan Ralph. Welcome to the chat. Susan says, Dr. Hegstrom on Arrested Development. Life is all about getting out of the terrible twos. Uh-huh. Yeah. Good point. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. Let's see. Okay. Uh, Seashells uh, 200 says, Thank you. This knowledge is a blessing, but isolating uh, because you, unless you've been through it, people won't get it or even recognize it. Yeah, that part. That whole part. This is why some people, I think, they just, you know, they thumb their nose at narcissistic abuse, which is unfortunate. But on the other hand, I will say that it does seem like more people are becoming vocal about it. And I think that's a good thing. We still have some ways to go, but I think more people are becoming a little bit more vocal and there is more awareness. Uh, you know, for instance, there are counselors who are becoming more aware on how to, uh, um, to uh, well, I was going to say treat, but the I don't really want to use that word here. Okay, not 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 in this instance. I will say that there are some counselors who are becoming more aware on how to discuss okay, things that have happened with their clients. Okay, if they have been dealing with a narcissist or cluster personality type. And even you know there are some counselors who are um speaking with or they're, you know, the, they have clients who are coming in to see them that do have cluster B personality types. Perhaps not a narcissistic personality, but maybe they have been diagnosed with uh, the uh, borderline personality, okay, uh, or antisocial personality. But some of these personality types, they, they also have co occurring. Uh, conditions such as um, bipolar or 
Uh, what's another one? I, I know I saw some videos about this. Uh, some narcissistic personality types, they may uh, deal with alcoholism. Sometimes people who thought that their loved one uh, was an alcoholic, turns out that they were a cluster B personality type and vice versa. Some people think that the person is a cluster B personality type when maybe, hey, they're just, you know, they have problems with alcohol, okay? But they, they sometimes uh, intertwine. A cluster B personality type will have uh, issues with substance abuse and or alcoholism, okay? But yeah, there are some people, unless they went through it, they just don't get it. D Majesty, thank you so much for the super chat. You're welcome. Yep, you helped me a lot. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Let's see. Nathan says atonement. Um, uh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, uh, narcissists, they tend to want to sweep things up under the rug, especially if they know they harmed you. Uh, they want to sweep things up under the rug. They want to go ahead and just <laughs> pretend like it never happened. Well, their aim is to obtain more source supply. And sometimes it's because they're trying to hoover certain people back in because they don't have anywhere else to go. They have run out of options. Um, but sometimes it's not because they ran out of options. They just want to add on to. They, see, they don't want to run out of supply. And sometimes it's an ego, it's an ego thing. They want to see if they can pull you back in. But, you know, most of the time, it's just like the narcissist who's going to the gas station. They may be running on empty, and they're trying to get to a particular place. They don't want to run out of gas before they get to that place. So they don't care who they come across to fill that gas tank. They don't care who it is, just as long as the gas tank is full so they can get to where they're trying to go. For instance, somebody may <laughs> uh, help them fill the gas tank, and the narcissist will pull right on off and leaving them standing right there on the road. <laughs> right? Leave them standing right there. But they're trying to get to where they're trying to get, regardless of who helps them. Yeah, so let's see. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Isis Bella, welcome to the live stream. She says, my child's dad is a narc. How do I deal with him? Okay, well, uh, I have done a lot of videos on the narcissist uh, spouse, uh, family members, but I will tell you, I haven't done a lot of videos on co-parenting with the uh, narcissist. I've done one or two, okay? So as far as like co-parenting with a narcissist, what I could do is go ahead and send you that video, or I will put the link to that video in the description box for you, okay? But I haven't done a lot of videos on that. Uh, I think it was like one or two, okay? But uh, I appreciate you sharing that, Isis. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a tough one too. I've heard a lot of testimonies on this one. Me personally, I haven't had that one. This is why I haven't done videos on that. I haven't co-parented with a, a narcissist. So, um, you know, I appreciate you sharing that, okay? All right. But I will tell you this, I will tell you this, and this is based off of some of the testimony I have heard. When it comes down to uh, having to go to court with him or her, you will have to have your ducks lined up in a row twice over. You, you will have to be very careful about the information you're putting out there and what your steps will be. Don't tell a lot, have a very small circle. I will tell you that because narcissists tend to like to sniff around a lot of people that you know, love and care about, and who love and care about you, and who may know you. See, some people don't understand and understand what it's like to be involved with a narcissist. So sometimes, unfortunately, you know, and unconsciously, a family member or a loved one can end up helping the narcissist. If you're co-parenting with him, with the narcissist, some people, some of your loved ones can end up helping the narcissist and causing you uh, more grief. And again, this is not intentional, but this is why, you know, you might want to keep a very tight circle about what you're doing and what your plans are. Strategize the strategy, plan the planning twice over. 
That's the best thing I can say about that one, okay? But the best of luck to you. Well, you may don't need luck, but the best to you, okay? Thank you so much, Isis. Okay, let's see. All right, welcome to the live stream kingdom. All right, how do we protect our energy from the psychic attacks? Their diabolical behavior is sadistic and they're, they're my neighbors and I cannot move yet. <laughs> okay, well, I've done some videos about this too, okay? So, for instance, when you're dreaming about him or her, most of the times, it's, it, of course, it's not intentional. But this is a one way that narcissists do, um, do the psychic attacks, right? They like to stay in the center of your mind. They like to hijack the consciousness of those that they want to uh, obtain source supply from. Now, the video that I did, uh, I think it was about three months ago, about dreaming of the narcissist, when you are dreaming of the narcissist, guess what? That's your dream. It's not the narcissist's dream. It's yours. So that means you have some control. One of the things that is very powerful to do, and that is to keep a dream journal. I mentioned that earlier in the stream. But when that narcissist shows up in your dreams, guess what you can do? And, I, and I'm challenging you, kingdom, to try this. You look at them and you tell them to leave. You don't ask them to leave. You tell them to leave. It's your dream, not theirs. Yeah, ch I challenge you to do that. You tell them to leave. And they're going to have to leave. If you are having flashbacks, okay, in your waking state, because this is, this is something else that happens too. If you are having flashbacks, it's going to also help you to practice the self-relegatory process that I was talking about. Should you become triggered? Okay? But when it comes down to seeing them and they're on your mind a lot, they're showing up in your dreams, you may think that they're playing mind tricks or, you know, most of the time they play mind tricks anyway. But one of the best things to do is when you're dreaming, tell them to leave. I don't care if you have to practice this. When you're in a state of dreaming, you have more control than you think you do. I don't want to get too deep into this. This is not what my channel is about, but I will tell you that once you claim what is yours, that is your dream, the narcissist cannot claim it. Narcissists have a habit of claiming people's lives. They will claim your life. Hope that you won't claim your life. That's what they hope. It's time for you to claim your life. That means your dreams as well. Are you claiming your dreams? Are you making it manifest? The dream. And when a narcissist shows up in your dream, they, you know, that's another psychic attack. I'm not trying to make these narcissists seem like they're all powerful and no, no. But once you stop telling yourself they're powerful, they're, they cease to be powerful. So I challenge you, kingdom, next time that they show up in your dreams, tell that sucker to leave. You can tell them a few other things too, but I'm not, I'm not trying to be, <laughs> I was going to say something, but I think you get the gist of it. <laughs> you could tell them to go somewhere else. Get out of your dreams and go to, ah, beep. <laughs> All right. But anyway, I wish you the best on that one. And um, maybe you can share with us and tell us, tell us how it goes. But yeah, that is another form of psychic attack that narcissists like to do, and that is to show up in your dreams. Okay, but once you claim your dreams, they can't claim it. Once you claim your life, they can't claim it. Once you claim your identity, they can't claim it. Once you claim your mind, they can't claim it. Stop claiming what doesn't belong to you and claim what does. Stop claiming who you're not and start claiming who you are. When they show up in your dreams, psychic attacks, they look at you like you a punk, okay? You're a pushover. Stop agreeing. So when they show up in your dreams, tell that mofo to leave. 
okay? <laughs> and they got to do it. They have to comply. They have to comply. Tell the truth, and the narcissist has to flee. Tell the truth, the narcissist has to flee. I dare you to try it. <laughs> I dare you to try it. Okay. Welcome to the another live stream, Steffi. Glad to see you tonight. <laughs> All right. So Steffi says, yes, Luminous, you are so right about that once you see them as not powerful, they cease to have power. They just want you to always believe they do. It's a marriage, just like their false self. Yep. There you go. There you go. Welcome to the live stream, Lisa. The narc tries to tell me that I love him. Well, of course they're going to try to convince you of that. But you know better, right? Yeah, you know better. And when I say you know better, I mean, I'm not trying to say that you should know better. No, I'm, I'm telling you that you do. Intuitively, you know. You just know. You know, right? <laughs> but they always try to convince, you know, narcissists, they will sometimes try to convince people uh, of what they want them to believe. Okay? They don't even know who they are, who they are half the time. But yeah, when they when they often when they even when they tell you that they love you, yeah, I would challenge that. Challenge it. Challenge, challenge, challenge. Matter of fact, challenge everything that a narcissist says. And even when they show up in your dreams and try to F with you there, challenge it. I know I did. It worked for me. It worked for me. Okay? Challenge it. Everything they say, everything to do, you know, challenge it. They're hoping you won't. But that is another way that you're demonstrating your growth. Right? And just checking some of y'all comments here. And I really appreciate you all showing up tonight and participating in the live stream. Uh, of course, there's another live stream coming up shortly. Um, but, you know, I, had th I was thinking about Maybe what I'll do is uh, every time I do a video, I'll just recap. Unless you all, is something else you all want me to talk about, I can. Um, but I usually like to stick to what I, what I know, what I've experienced. Right? So, um, let's see. Let's see. Lisa, Lisa says... Good info. It's amazing to know I'm not the only one. He speaks to me telepathically. Wow. Yeah. Um, which can also be uh, another form of psychic attack. Uh, again, narcissists, when you think about how much a person is involved with narcissists, I mean, day in, day out, uh, especially if you live with him or her, uh, they're in your energy a lot. So this is not something that is surprising that he or she can show up in your dreams. Um, but as far as like speaking telepathically, uh, wow. Yeah. That is another form of psychic attack or could be another form of psychic attack. Now, when I say this about narcissists, I don't, I'm not suggesting that they're all powerful and they're more powerful than you. It's just that when they are in a person's life, they're in their energy a lot. Okay. We're all comprised of energy. So when a narcissist is there a lot in your energy, then it kind of goes hand in hand. They're probably going to show up in your dreams. Now, sometimes the dreams will reveal to us uh, something that we need to resolve. In other words, the, other, the person that's showing up, we may want them to um, help us close something or to obtain closure. But the bottom line is reality no, they're not going to be able to help you with that. Sometimes you have to just snatch back what belongs to you. 
Your mind is yours. Your consciousness is yours. Okay, your, your gateway. Narcissists tend to have gateways. And <laughs> you don't want to cross those. You don't know what's going to... What's, once those gateways are crossed, I'm talking about a narcissist now, that you don't know what kind of darkness you might find. Those demons, they have to slay. And I'm just speaking metaphorically, okay, figuratively speaking. They have to slay that. But the bottom line is narcissists, they don't like to resolve issues. They like to leave things unsaid and undone, which is another reason why we dream. There are things that, are, that need to be resolved in our lives, things that we need to know things that are brought to our attention. So when you dream about a narcissist, just just another thing. That's another way of looking at that. They're, a, they're in your energy. Do they need to be there? The critical question that I was asking before, which is one of my favorite critical questions to ask, and that is what is the purpose of the relationship with him or her? Are they bringing quality? Are they helping you to bring quality to your life? Not saying they're responsible for your happiness because they're not. But when narcissists show up in your dreams, yeah, that's just another way of looking at it. Does something need to be resolved? What are they in your life for? To the point where they're showing up in your dreams. What role does a narcissist play in your life? Yeah, very, it's very deep. You know, dreaming is another way of releasing energy that's heavy. So if that narcissist is showing up in your dreams, perhaps it's time to, what? Emotionally detach, spiritually detach from him or her, from the relationship. Maybe the relationship has come to a close. Maybe they're showing up in your dreams, psychically attacking, right? And this, this is just an example. I'm not picking on anybody. The bottom line is this. When we dream, that is another way of releasing energy. When we're sleeping, we're still what? Comprised of energy. Energy moves. When you express your emotions, that is your energy in motion. The, ener the, the emotions, again, your energy is supposed to move. It's not supposed to be stagnant. So when a, when a narcissist shows up in your dreams, perhaps it's time to release something or someone. Yeah. Yeah. So the psychic attacks are very real. You know, I've, I've read some uh, on social media. I have read some testimonies about psychic attacks uh, by narcissists or people being psychically attacked by narcissists. Now, see, I um, have seen some videos about this. It's very interesting, but this is something that's not far-fetched. Now, of course, the couple of cluster B personality types that I have had in my life at one time, of course, I've had dreams about them. No question. But once I told them to leave, they had to leave, and they did. And sometimes it takes more than one time to do it, though. Okay, so let's see here. We're getting ready to wrap this up, guys. <laughs> so I didn't want to stay on too long tonight. Um, but again, you know, I know we have a holiday weekend coming up. And... Uh, I may go ahead and come back on maybe on Saturday. Yeah, if not Saturday, it'll be early next week after the holiday. But I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight and joining me. And uh, I'm just still going over your, your comments. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> any more questions? Yeah. Okay, guys. Um, yeah. Okay. So we're going to wrap this up. And I love you guys. Take care of yourself. And remember, it is worth your thriving forward. Okay? Take care of yourself. Take care of your loved ones. I know y'all doing that. But sometimes, especially now, when things are grabbing at our attention, right? You know, it's, it, you just got to take time out to relax. Take care of yourself and allow people to love you, okay? It's, you know, I was talking about the trust issue earlier. Narcissists have a way, you know, that experience with them, having that narcissistic codependent relationship, it has a way of leaving an energetic residue that is real funky. 
Allow people to love you. Okay? Trust yourself. You got it. Okay? You got this. Right now, energetically, there are some people who are harvesting. They're even embedding. Okay? What I mean by that? Trying to cover their energy, right? Or cover your energy with theirs. I may mention this on the next live stream because there's a lot of energy harvesting going on right now. People are trying to swap out contracts. They are trying to um, embed energies with other people. Um, You know, that's just another way of saying that they're trying to get people to suffer the consequences of their poor actions or their poor choices or their um, negativity. So make sure you're very mindful of your energy right now, okay? Uh, Take care of yourself. And I know some of you have loved ones who are around, and I'm glad you have that. But allow people to love and care about you, you know? Yeah, allow that. It's hard, though, after a narcissist has, has groomed you and perhaps believing that you don't deserve that. But, you know, the next time the narcissist tries to go to you in the argument or they're trying to come at you, yeah, and I'm not saying go toe-to-toe with them and start an argument, but just, you know, be mindful. Be mindful of yourself. What makes you feel good? Where do you want to be? Where do you see your, yourself heading? Is the narcissist there? That's another challenge for y'all, Right? The next time you start thinking about love, anything that's positive in your life, see how many times the narcissist pops up in your mind. Yeah, that part. (laughs) They probably won't show up. But whenever you think about drama, pain, anguish, they always there, aren't they? (laughs) So, okay, I want to just leave you all with that. And until next time, take care of yourself and each other now just one person okay i just saw somebody pop up r davis welcome to the live stream just saw you buddy or (laughs) ma'am thanks star for being here in this community all right well thank you all of you okay i love y'all take care now